Good Saturday evening, everybody. We're in Savannah, Georgia. As we stand in front of the United States Customs House, we're gonna go do a pub crawl, a haunted pub crawl from Ghost City Tours. Now there's no paranormal investigation happening for the tour because we're gonna go and have a couple of beverages. I think we have some ghost stories yeah, and some of the history. Yeah, they're like history of the city and stuff. I have we're gonna do something new. And we're in front of Tundee's Tavern, where we need to meet our host. Perhaps our ghost host. Mm. This is our first stop, and this place is haunted as well. You can get a drink and get in a to-go cup so that we're ready to walk around. I think the first one we'll get is Two Sides Tan Lines from Savannah. We're heading downstairs. So our tour guide, Jackie, told us that we go to five bars and two non-bar locations. So it's a bit of a walking journey all around Savannah. There are undoubtedly beautiful cities, and I am certainly have their ghosts. Oh, but none of those cities are actually built upon their dead. Here in the historic district of Savannah alone, there are over 20,000 individuals buried beneath our buildings, our streets, our sidewalks, and our squares. Now, after the Civil War was over, some of these newly freed individuals returned to the city, hoping to find the friends and family that they have lost on that day. I'm not sure if they found who they were looking for, but what I do know is they found Joseph Bryan still walking the streets of Savannah. But then this building was formerly a slave auction house. Hey, in fact, there's a tunnel entrance to this and basement known hidden away behind the artwork on the landing. For some of the um, former slaves haunting this basement. The, building. the slave house auctioneer is a very violent man and would beat people to death in the basement of this location. This statue is very heavy, made out of concrete. One night, overnight, while it was closed, ended up at the bottom of the stairs, unexpectedly. To get the stairs down to River Street, there's a city hall over to the left. Wow, check out the street. Kulski story. In 1842, there are four of them, two that are connected, there are two more beyond that, and the other end of the tunnel is Cyrus and Tommy's Tavern, actually ends just past the fourth vault. Now, the read the historical markers in the front of these vaults, they're going to claim that these vaults were used to store cotton. But many historians and archaeologists in the city of Savannah think that's the city's way of sanitizing a history that it's justifiably not proud of, and that these vaults were actually used to store people, used in the slave trade. This area is known for capturing orbs and other odd experiences. I didn't bring the full spectrum camera here, but I did bring my EMF meter, so let's see if anything happens in here. Nothing. So while the city says that these rooms were used for housing cotton, the dispute is that these rooms were actually housed for holding slaves. Hence the reason for these windows. And this tunnel used to go to Tundee's Tavern where we just were. It's been bricked over since then. This building in the background is the old cotton exchange. So we're walking down Bay Street now to our next location. Alright, looks like we're going into East Bay Inn next. This bar is called Tanda. Inside East Bay Inn. The man that owned the business was named Edward Canifer. Lofty title, the Charlie Dress, as if he were king of the universe. He always wore well tailored suits, high top hats. Didn't hurt matters that Charlie was said to be movie star handsome. At the Lenora laid eyes on Charlie. She came by a lot more often. Now eventually her husband had to leave town on a business trip, and I don't think his ship had even cleared this port before Charlie was here to ask, I'm sorry, before Lenora was here to ask Charlie for a tour of the building. Charlie and Lenora spent a rather long time up there, all alone, 
looking at Star Edge. Now, while her husband was away, Lenora was here every single solitary day for her tour of the building, always spending hours all alone with Charlie on that third floor. Stepped inside his building, all of his other employees stared at him with shocked expressions. They knew what was going on that very moment on the third floor, and no one knew how to tell him. He was a little taken aback by their less than enthusiastic response to his return. So he decided to go up to his office on the second level and take care of a little bit of paperwork. He had barely sat down at his desk, though, when he heard a strange noise coming from that third floor. Oh. Dare I say a banging noise? <laughs> I knew what that noise was. When he opened the door to the room it was coming from, there he found Charlie. Now, for once, Charlie had on none of his fine apparel. In fact, Charlie was entirely new. Lenora did have on two garments, her corset and Charlie's top hat. <laughs> her husband was not amused. He waited right in on Charlie with fists flying, and to Charlie's credit, he did not even try to fight back. It was simply a defense. He kept backing up further and further until he was backed up against the wall of the room. He landed a lucky punch on Charlie's chin and sent him vaulting backwards out of a third floor window. He busted his skull when he hit the Lincoln Street sidewalk below. We're in the basement of the establishment now. Yeah. Let's see if we can take a couple pictures. Anything appears. I'm off on my own while everybody's off in the ladies' room. EMF. Normal. Other side. Nothing out of the ordinary except for the red hot chili peppers up above. <laughs> Alright. At the hotel. We got a vodka cream. George doing shots. There's the Nora and Charlie down there. Kenny, you belong going down there. Go. This is the window where Charlie fell out of. Third floor. Right to the ground below. The next bar we're going to has two counts of poisoning. A husband and wife. And the next person that owned the house. Also poisoned. This is Louis R. Lincoln. Lots of cocktail napkin drawings of Abraham Lincoln. I'm in the bathroom at Lincoln's. Fun tour so far. Not a lot of ghosts, but a lot of drinks. The next beer that George and I are sharing is <laughs> Southbound Mountain Jam Water. So we're back outside. Abe's on Lincoln. And you can see how this was a residential building before. Still heading up Lincoln. This is the Tell Farm Museums. Oh, and Thomas House and Slave Quarters. My has seen exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, and everybody has compared notes and agrees on what they something that lasts long enough. Check out that full wolf moon. Out of a tree just outside the window. That's happening. We're going to cross right over here. We're going to the next place. There were a lot of words, I gotta be honest, but there was a seven year old man that was having a baby with a 15 year old girl. And uh, it wasn't his baby, it was like a Melrose Place type thing. But there's a ghost in that area. And that mannequin woman represents the girl that was pregnant. And I'm not told there's a Ouija board up there in case you want to conjure up the spirit of Anne. Uh, now, before we go into 1790s, a couple things about the pub. Some of the best mixologists in the city, so if there's any wild and crazy cocktail you desire, they can certainly make it here. Uh, their signature drink is a key lime pie shot that tastes like dessert. Wait, there's a competing tour group over here that's also learning about this woman up here. They have a key lime pie shot. Tastes like pie. Oh my, look at this guy. I got a Jaeger bomb. And Mary got a key lime pie shot. I'm gonna taste it. <laughs> Holy cow, that is awesome. Oh, it even smells like it. Holy crap. I wasn't recording any of that. Who knows where I was recording. But wow, that was delicious. So this is where the older gentleman 
supposedly sired a child with the 15 year old, but that guy over there, he looks like Arnold Palmer, I gotta tell you. We're heading to the graveyard. It's a Colonial Park Cemetery. That was due to poor record keeping and some people simply never having a grave marker to begin with. Now in its earliest days, Colonial Park Cemetery did not look at all as it does today. Keeping the EMF out. Let's see if we get any tangible readings. Mary's left me behind. She doesn't care. This is like 99% pub crawl, 1% ghost. And we've come across another group getting a backstory about the ghosts here. Now we've been to the cemetery before. Well, it's been open during the day. We didn't see anything unusual at the time. There is yet another tour group right in front of us. This is said to actually represent there all the are previously no buried bodies below the bricks that extend beyond the fences of the cemetery here. So just a bit of a disparity. Now you might be wondering where you can that figure from foundation. To come to this graveyard, our Nothing unusual on the EMF meter. They used it to map where each and every body throughout the graveyard was. It took them two years. And at the end of those two years, they came up with a figure of 9,684 people buried within the boundaries of this fence, an estimated 2,000 on our side of the fence. Oh. Historical records to back this particular story up. That being said, people still claim to see this ghost, so I'm telling the story anyway. Renee Ash Rondelet was born in 1777, 10 blocks in that direction on St. Julian Street. His mother was in labor for three days before giving birth to a 16-pound baby boy. Wow. Okay, wow. that's the horse when my job is done. <laughs> I'm kidding. Renee grew apace with that mighty weight of birth by the time he was a young man of 11 or 12 years old, well over six feet tall. Now, despite his size and fearsome appearance, he was not very attractive either. Despite these things, he was shy and timid, and of course, every bully in Savannah liked to pick on him. They threw rocks at him, they called him names, if they could catch him, they would beat him up. Now, Renee found out quite by accident that if he ran here into the graveyard, those bullies wouldn't follow him. They were too superstitious to enter the burial ground. So this became Renee's safe space, and he spent day after day playing here amongst the crypts and bones. That continued for a few years, but then his neighbors down on St. Julian started to notice their pets were going missing. Cats and dogs, livestock went missing, chickens, goats, every single animal that was missing was ultimately found here in Colonial Park Cemetery, brutally eviscerated and torn apart. Of course, they blamed Renee, who else spent every day here? So a group of concerned citizens went down to Renee's parents' house and they knocked on the doors. They asked his parents to do something about their child. Perhaps his parents realized there was something not quite right about Renee because they readily agreed. Now the stories differ here. Some stories say he's imprisoned in the attic of the home. Others that it was an outbuilding right next to the house. One way or another, his parents imprisoned their own child. Every now and then, Renee would escape from that prison. Every time he escaped, he was seen here in Colonial Park Cemetery. And every time he was seen here, another animal was found torn apart. These escapes were very infrequent, so no one did anything about them. This mausoleum has bodies grounded and placed in receptacles at the front so that other bodies can be placed on top of it. The last pub awaits. Crazy even on the quietest night in Savannah. Now the Dunnas was actually built in 1861 as the residence of a man by the name of Timothy Mingus who lived there with his 14 year old daughter Rose. They lived on the upper levels of the building and ran the ground floor as a curiosity shop. Nobody in Savannah had any interest in what Timothy was selling and he was going broke very, very quickly. And she snuck into her father's bedroom late at night, stole his key ring out of his jacket pocket, and went out back into the alley where she unchained the collar around the bear's neck. 
the bear mauled her to death. Good. Timothy immediately oh. sold the building and moved away, but Rose Mee's ghost is encountered in McDonald's to this very day. Right, we're heading over to McDonald's. McDonald's? Billy's place. Upstairs? The Norgon Warrior? Mary is chocolate wasted. Poor George. He's gone ass up at this point. He's done. <laughs> Don't try to use him as an excuse. So we did get some more food to soak up this alcohol. Half these wings are hot, half of them are sweet chili. And some fries. So I'm not sure about ghosts. It was a fun tour tonight. Yes. But very much more focused on pub crawl. And yes. uh, the fact that I just walked into a giant bush back there <laughs> really emphasizes the pub crawl. The theater, last time we were here, had Elf. This time, Beatles by request. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. The walk back to the hotel may be the spookiest part of the night. <laughs> oh man, we got one more block to go to get to the hotel. We're passing people that have partied out back there. Just, <laughs> Just sitting. sitting on the curb. We're so close. <laughs> Look at this, we got the Thunderbird right up ahead. All right, we're back home for the night. If Mary went to the right room, that would be great. And we're back. All right, so Ghost City Tours, that was a lot of fun. Not a lot of ghosts. I'm gonna get a lot of reception on the EMF meter as well, but a lot of fun altogether. More of a bar crawl than it was a ghost hunt. So thanks a lot for coming along. Thank you very much for all of your likes, comments, and subscriptions. Treat others the way you wanna be treated. Have a great night. We'll see you guys.